gueule. The food, fooding back there. Mm. You know, a lot of people in this room have been to Caribou. Mm. Yeah, like Tina, Ken, John, us. Who else? I wonder how many people in here have been there. You know? Interesting. All right, let's make a start. You hear me on this? Yeah? No? <laughs> if we could make a start. Hello? Yo. All right, well, it's um, <laughs> my great pleasure to introduce our speaker this week, uh, Candy Faller um, from the Smithsonian. Um, I just have a few little notes here. Uh, so, as well as having a, a Bachelor in Biology from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and a PhD from Georgetown University in DC, and having had a, a very um, impressive career since that time, a lot of people wouldn't know that, well, as well as being a, a champion for Smithsonian boating regulations, <laughs> that, um, that prior to this, Candy was a scientific illustrator. Is this, this is one of yours? Yes, they are mine, yeah. Now, I apologize if you still get royalties because I plagiarized <laughs> this from the web without paying for it, <laughs> or properly citing it. These belong to Uncle Sam, you know. Okay, well, I'm fine, I've, I've taken them. Um, and also, I think uh, there's not many of us that can say when we do a field experiment that, hey, I, I did a field experiment and you can see the results on Google Earth. So these are some of the phosphorus treatments in the, the dwarf mangroves at Twin Keys, and you can see by the size of those trees out in the dwarf forests that they're quite phosphorus limited there. But that's uh, all I wanted to say just to introduce Candy. Um, so welcome and enjoy. I Thank will just. Thank you. So am I live? Yeah, OK. Most of my work has been um, in, once, once I became an ecologist, after becoming an, being an illustrator, I had to give that up to be an ecologist. Somehow I couldn't do both. But um, I have got a, a new thing, which is uh, history. And I never, I really didn't take a whole lot of interest in, in studying history when I was either in high school or college. I am so sorry. Um, because I had no idea how to um, how to even go about doing historical research, and um, then I discovered it was relevant to mangroves. So all of a sudden, I had to dig back into um, this historical literature and how to pull out stuff. And you know, we want to analyze things, we want to compare and have statistics. I have yet to figure out how to do that with historical bits and pieces of information. So after you see this, if you know a way of doing that, I would, I would certainly love to hear it. OK. So I'm going to talk about um, uh, mangroves and climate change and using an, a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach to try and first figure out what the past was. We, we sort of know what we think the present is although it might be a little a little biased by sh as our shifting baseline idea really comes into play with think I want you to think about that as you're you're seeing some of this historical stuff and then what that means to uh, future and specifically about this um, this hot topic of mangrove expansion that a lot of people are thinking about these days that one yeah okay so uh, both mangroves and salt marshes are uh, coastal wetlands, we know, and they're both foundation species. They create habitat. They actually create the structure that so many things need, and they determine the, um, the rate of all kinds of ecological processes. But there are some um, dramatic differences between the two. Mangroves are woody. Salt marshes are herbaceous. Uh, mangroves are typically, you think of them as being tropical, salt marshes as being temperate. Um, 
and they're, they're arrayed in these weird biogeographical zones that, that Norm Duke has given names to that sometimes work and sometimes don't. Um, but both occur at this uh, transition between temperate and tropical zones. So you see in the map there, the green line above uh, and green line to the south, that's generally the distribution of salt marsh with that orange around the middle is what we think of where mangroves occur between generally between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, but we all know they're actually further north than that and much further south than that. Um, but at the, where they come together, uh, there, there's this distinct mangrove salt marsh ecotone where both occur and uh, have, have been that way for a long time. But over the past 30 years, um, a lot of people have noticed that mangroves are moving uh, northward or poleward, and they're, when they're moving into area that's already occupied by salt marshes for the most part. And that the, um, the driving force behind that appears to be uh, climate change. A warming climate has allowing mangroves to move uh, into these more poleward systems faster than it has in the past. So that's what we're seeing in, in real time. So a lot of this stuff, a lot of the work I've been doing recently has been in Florida, and Florida's a really nice place to work on this mangrove expansion because it's this north-south um, uh, latitudinal gradient that we have. And um, I know one of these is an arrow. It's okay. So in the southern half of the state, it's from about 28 degrees southward. It's for all intents and purposes tropical and pure mangroves when you go to the coastline. Then above 30 degrees on the Atlantic coast, northward, that's, that's, right, that's north of St. John's River, north of Jacksonville, approaching the Georgia coast. That from there northward, it's certainly all salt marshes, if it's anything. But that zone between the two, about a two degree latitudinal difference there, is, um, is the ecotone. To the southern part of that ecotone there, just below Merritt Island uh, on the Atlantic coast, uh, around 28 degrees, if you go there, it's about 90% mangrove and 10% salt marsh. But by the time you get up to the top of the ecotone up there by north of Jacksonville, it's mostly salt marsh with just an occasional uh, mangrove. We've, um, um, my ex post who's now a professor at uh, UCLA, did this gorgeous study, and he pulled together eight years of Landsat images from 1984 to 2011. And he looked at the change, you know, he modeled, put all those images together and looked at the change in distribution of mangroves along the coast. And what he found was here in this panel on the left that up to the north, there was literally a 100% increase in mangroves. There was no mangroves in that area and those er detectable in those early Landsat images, the 84 images. You go down to the southern parts of the state, there's very little change that's happened. If anything, you, we've lost mangroves, but there's not been much of a gain to the south. But that's a huge gain up to the north. And he, he and... Um, Change in mangrove cover was tightly correlated with a change in number of days below minus four degrees C. So minus four degrees seems to be some kind of a threshold, but you have this very nice linear relationship. And then Kyle had a second paper that came out in Global Change Biology in 2015, where with this information, he calculated that based on these data that the the mangrove range would push forward um, by 2.2 to 3.2 kilometers a year over the next 50 years. So this is a very dynamic northward movement. So that's what came out of those studies. Now this is not just happening in Florida. This is happening all over the world, actually. Here's some pictures that I picked out for, for there up on the upper right hand is uh, Amelia Island, this is four inlets north of the St. John's River in Florida. Your next inlet would be the St. Mary's River in, in Georgia. Um, 
then uh, Cape San Blas going out in the Panhandle, and um, Horn Island here. This is, this is this is Aaron's image out of his recent paper. But over there, Deco Beach. This is on the west coast of Florida. This is this like isolated patch of mangroves there, this, and it's been there for. Uh, I found references to it that are 100 years old. But um, Port Fouchon is pretty much a, a mangrove system now. And you go on down to Texas. Texas in 95, this same coast, there were no mangroves visible in aerial photographs of this area. And now it's a mangrove forest. So this change is happening dramatically all around the Gulf of Mexico, that mangroves are appearing in places they haven't been in a uh, recent time. This is not just happening in Florida and the Gulf of Mexico. It's also happening in Australia and New Zealand. Here in, New, here in Australia, for example, this is down by Wilson's Corner, which is around the corner in, in uh, South Australia. This is a study site that's receiving a lot of work from, uh, from people in Australia on this mangrove expansion. This is on the west side. This other one here, this is uh, Bunbury in Western Australia. Same thing is happening there, but there's like... I have yet to find a paper coming out of this site that anyone is working there. So what does mangrove expansion on the ground look like? This is Amelia Island, and like I say, that's up on the east coast of Florida. Next step would be the St. Mary's River in Georgia. And that's a salt marsh picture that I took in 2005. And you see the little red circle I just put in there? Keep your eye on that in this picture. This is in 2017. There's a little mangrove that's growing there. And you can look at that little mangrove close, and it's making babies. And um, we have worked out how to age these plants. There's very uh, distinctive growth pattern that uh, differ differentiates winter versus summer growth. So you can count the intervals of summers as you go up the stem. So that little tree is about 14 years old. And it's the only the way only way it's going to expand is if something happens and brings in more propagules or it creates its own little patch with its own little babies. But that's what mangrove expansion looks like. This is another way it looks like this is in the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge, just outside the Kennedy Space Center. You know, the gates are over there. Um, and you, there's this nice bird reading road. People drive this road and there's just gazillion birds, right? A um, little dirt road one way. And there's places to pull over. And there's a one that says that you stop and you look at it and it tells you what you're looking at. And it's the salt marsh. And it's even got a list there of the species of salt. But if you look at there closely in that, even in that illustration that's there, you can see that there's some texture that's different. And certainly in that marsh out there, you can see that there are some little mangroves out there. If you look at that close up, there's clearly a lot of little mangroves there in 2005. But I went back to that same spot in 2016, and this is not just a little few mangroves. This is a mangrove forest now. So this is happening. This is localized expansion. It, the other one was latitudinal expansion, and this is a mangrove getting established and then uh, spreading locally. So those two kinds of mangrove expansion are happening. So um, people have been looking at this marsh to mangrove transition for a while. And the first series of studies came out with people working down or working on um, uh, the effects of sea level rise and storminess, pushing mangrove propagules further into, into the marsh. It's more of a salinization process so that mangroves were, getting, being, were being pushed up into the sawgrass and the tree islands and getting established. And there's been lots of papers uh, that have, have worked on that. Then a um, little bit later, there's, people started working on uh, the, this idea of uh, warming, a warming climate with lower frequency and intensity of, of freezes are not just allowing these mangroves to move inland with the sea level rise, but they're moving latitudinally with this uh, warming climate. And again, lots of papers, including our 2014 and 15 papers. But then um, there's a recognition that mangroves are expanding, sure, but they've also contracted. So there's this mangrove expansion and contraction that has happened. And so far, there's been a couple of papers on that. 
And this, this has happened multiple times. Uh, these papers hypothesize that this has happened multiple times in the past and that it's controlled by extreme freeze events. Uh, uh, Rodriguez, Rodri Wilfred Rodriguez was also a postdoc with me, and uh, he's a remote sensing guy, and then Mike Oslin is from the USGS in Lafayette. So I'm going to focus in on Wilfred's uh, data since I'm more familiar with that. We have a uh, study site up near St. Augustine, and that's where the star is there on the East Coast, right there. And this is a big salt marsh, and we got, there's, I'm sure that Alabama has it too, but there's this wonderful archive of historical photographs of the coastline. And so we tapped into that resource, and those that top panel of illustrations, I'm going to zoom in, yeah, this is the actual detail of the site. It's at the south end of Anastasia Island. That's Matanzas Inlet, if you know where that is, Matanzas River. So um, St. Augustine as a city is about 14 miles north of there, so that's where you are. Um, and in that red circle, I turned that off, I swear to God I did. This is a robocall. Oh, will you throw that out the window or something? <laughs> yeah. But anyway, in that in that red circle, you see that site. I don't know. It's it's not as super clear, but that little round area that reappears in all those images, that's a sinkhole. That's a permanent fixture, and it's it's like having a, a rock that you can georeference on. So it's really it was quite useful for georeferencing the images. Anyway, these um, these four pictures at the top from 42 to 80 are aerial photographs that we got um, uh, from the University of Florida Historical Image Library. Then these the lower uh, group of images from 2014 are. Um, our satellite images, Iconis in 95, and then that 2014 was a Worldview 2 that I had done specially for this study. And so Wilford did the remote sensing on this, and then he got into the, each of these images, made sure they were geo-referenced, um, particularly the aerial photographs. They were pretty vertical, but they needed a little tweaking. Anyway, he, did, he used his magic remote sensing tools and did land cover classification and vegetation mapping. And here, the green, the bright green is uh, mangroves, the yellow is salt marsh, and then the gray is unvegetated. And as you can see the site, the gray around it is mostly wet or mud flats. And you can see in 42, there was some mangroves there, but not so many. And then they increased dramatically about half of the site in 52, and then they started decreasing again and decreasing again until about 2014, they start increasing again. So there's this big change over time. So he, Wilfred did these, put this into a cover analysis, and this is here on the y-axis, total area percentage of these two vegetation types and, um, through these years. And as you can see, the, do, the solid line is mangroves, the dotted line is salt marsh. 42, almost no mangrove, but when there's almost no mangrove, there's lots of salt marsh, and, and vice versa. As you go through time, so... No mangrove, mangrove increases, then mangroves decrease again, and then mangroves increase again. So just in those 70 plus years, we can see this oscillation between uh, mangroves and salt marsh. Well, you got to wonder what's causing that, right? So I decided to look at what, what big environmental drivers might be out there. And they are specifically in this area, these freeze events that everybody says it's the freeze events that's killing them down. But there's also hurricanes. So in 1940, there was this huge freeze event. It got down to, I think, my, and I got the data specifically for St. Augustine. Oh, I, I'll put it up here. Minus 11 degrees. This was a multi-day freeze. Minus 11 degrees, right? So there's no wonder there's no mangroves left after that. But in 1944, there was the Cuba, Florida hurricane that came up the coast in October, when mangroves to the south would have been full of propagules. So whoosh up the coast with water carrying mangrove propagules. That's my idea anyway. <laughs> uh, anyway, mangroves increase. And then in, in the 50s and 60s, there's more freeze events. 
And then you get out in 1977, 1981, 1983, 1985, 1989, killer freeze events. So by 1989, there would, it was one freeze event after, there's no record, there's no decade in history that has been that many freeze events in, in Florida that I can, uh, you know, and I've searched the literature. But in 2004, we had a bunch of hurricanes and two in particular that came up the coast in 2004. Again, in October, when trees were full of propagules to the south. So following this, those uh, hurricanes in 2004, we've started to see this increase in, uh, in mangroves at this site. So we've modified the hypothesis just a tad. So mangroves have expanded in contraction in the ecotone yeah, we see that. Severe freeze events can kill the mangroves and allow a salt marsh to dominate, but hurricanes appear to favor mangroves. That seems to be a pattern. So I was trying to figure out how to work on that. How, how do you get at that? This is so, it's not like you have a timeline. It's so episodic, you know. You, people didn't keep records of this. People don't want to know what happened to, to citrus if it freezes, but they could care less about some mangroves freezing, right? Uh, so it's really hard to, to fish this out of the literature. So I, um, I've, I found this wonderful paper in the Journal of Climate by Rogers and Rowe, and they, they got into that same history of freeze events. And it was, their paper was in 91, shortly after the 89 freeze. And there was a flurry of papers on freeze events. So after this past winter where we've had all these polar vortexes, the, this is a seriously hot topic in the climate literature. If you go online and look at polar vortex, you're going to be eat up with, with publications that are, are coming now in response to the freeze events we just had. Anyway, so they, they um, dissected these freeze events for me. And these are, they call them uh, polar anticyclones. But there's other terms that we're hearing on the news now. There's cold air outbreaks, CAOs, uh, polar vortex, uh, polar outbreak, extreme cold. The citrus people call them impact freezes. And when they say impact freeze, that means a freeze that's severe enough to kill off entire groves and to force the growers to move their groves further south. That's what they mean by uh, an impact freeze. So. Um, the, the way these, the Rogers and Rowley describe this is this, this polar vortex, this polar anticyclone happens, and the cold air escapes from the Arctic, and it pours down the middle of the country to the east side of the, down the Great Plains. They say it takes 24 to 48 hours for that cold air, and this is an anticyclone, so it's, it's going counterclockwise, whereas cyclones are going clockwise, right? So it's coming down the middle of the country, 4 to 48 hours, and it hits the Gulf Coast, and it doglegs to the east, and it slows down. So cold air goes right along the Gulf of Mexico and right on over to Florida and killing everything in its wake. And hence, any mangroves that might have been on the coast of, of the Gulf of Mexico are hit by the same freeze events that get to the east side or to the west side of Florida as well. So I... I um, put together as best I could um, all the freeze events that uh, were greater or colder than minus 8 degrees C and that lasted more, uh, two or more days. Um, and then I also got into, NOAA has this wonderful historical um, hurricane website, so you can go in and query their website for, for the uh, direction of the track you want to go after, uh, its proximity where the eye passes to a particular landmark, and you can specify the time. So I ask it for north, south to north, uh, within 50 kilometers of St. Augustine, and happening between September and November. And what I got was this. So the top row there are severe freeze events, and the bottom row is uh, hurricanes. And these, these are hurricanes and freeze events that meet these criteria. And um, there's about as many cold events as there are freeze events, uh, as there are hurricanes, right? 
And there's a couple of these freeze events, like this, this one is off the charts. The, the, I, w I stopped at 51 because that's how far the NOAA website goes back, is 51. But the coldest, the most severe historical freeze that I can find reference to in the literature is this 1835 freeze, which was the mother of all freezes. They were growing citrus as far north as Charleston in 1834. But after 1835, they, there was nothing left. This, this was, um, I think it was minus 12 or colder than minus 12, and it lasted multiple days in St. Augustine, in Jacksonville, in that whole area. And then the second era there, I want to point out these, these two freeze events that happened in, in the winter of 1894, 1895. They call that the Great Freeze. And it was a freeze that happened in, in December. And then come February, they had another freeze. So it was, you know, a double shot of this super freeze event. So these things have, ha have been happening for a very long time. And there's no correlation that I can see, no relationship between there's a freeze event when there's a hurricane, you know. And we have predictions about hurricanes with respect to climate warming. But do we have predictions about freeze events with climate, with climate warming? So I had had that historical array of, of, of dates when I know there's freezes and, and hurricanes. But I went, also wanted to check out if I could find where mangroves might have been recorded. And again, citrus they'll tell you about, but mangroves you've got to work for. And this is, I, I dug into all kinds of sources, whatever I could find from naturalist journals to funnel surveys, personal journals, um, herbarium specimens, whatever I could dig out of the literature is what I pursued for this. And this, this is, this has taken me away from just about, I still go in the field, but it really is, it's all consuming, it truly is. Anyway, here, I have, I have many, many references, but I just pulled out some of the high points I thought you might, might get a kick out of. And, um, 1774, William Bartram, who was exploring the St. John River at the time, he tells us that he found a black mangrove, Avicennia, and, uh, on Anastasia Island. But Andre Michaud, very famous botanist, uh, French botanist, he found both Rhizophora and Avicennia on Anastasia Island at 14 miles south of St. Augustine, right where our study site is there. There was a, a, a city surveyor hired by the city of uh, St. Augustine, Charles Vignolis, and he was, um, he was a map maker, and, and uh, he had a job as a city engineer in St. Augustine, but his job was as a cartographer, geographer, and, and he came from Great Britain, and he did this in Florida. And he tells us, and the cool thing about his book, the name of the book is on observations on the Floridas and it's uh, there's a searchable PDF on Google Books if you that's that's where I found that um, anyway he he just defines what he means by mangrove which is unusual but he's talking about rhizophora when he's talking about mangrove so he describes these prop roots hanging down so we know specifically he's talking about rhizophora and he and he says the northernmost Rhizophora north of the uh, the Dunlawton Bridge, which is there in in uh, Daytona. Uh, Audubon came to Florida in 1835 to get a specimen of a brown pelican. He and his host Bulo at Bulo Sugar Plantation came down Bulo Creek into the Halifax River, and they ran aground on a mangrove island, and they almost froze together death because this was ha happened. They did this when that freeze of 1835 happened. This next one, Jacob Mott, he was a doctor uh, in the Army. He went to Florida to be the surgeon for the immigrating Indians. This is after passage of the Indian Removal Act. You know, the this Army was going to go down there and help the Indians move to Oklahoma. When they got there, they didn't want to go. So we have the Second Seminole War, and Mott became the surgeon to the Army guys as they fought over the next how many years? The, the war. Anyway, Mott kept a journal for crying out loud. And he he describes going through these mangroves after this freeze events. And again, he describes trees with these prop roots hanging. And these are just recently dead trees. And they've got all these white birds sitting in the top of them. 
Uh, it reminds him of cotton fields back home, he says. Anyway, this is in the Mosquito Lagoon just south of the Ponce Inlet. John Muir of you know, Yosemite fame. He had, right after the Civil War, he went to Florida and he did this book called A Thousand Mile Walk to the Gulf. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but in there he takes a ferry from St. Mary's City over to Fernandina Beach across the St. Mary's River and he describes, Muir's trained as a botanist, he describes Avicennia out in the salt marsh there in the St. Mary's River. Uh, before 1895, um, this area from Ponce Inlet to, to, uh, to Merritt Island, there was lots of big Abyssinia growing. And these guys had figured out that the honeybees love black mangroves. So they didn't call it mangrove. They called it black honey mangrove. And it, during that time period, it got to be the largest money-making crop before citrus, more than citrus. There was more honey made from honey mangrove than from citrus. And, anyway. uh, and there's several uh, beekeeping journals from the early 1900s that you find out all kind of wonderful information about. And I never would have thought to go to a, uh, the Bee Gazetteer or the Beekeeper's Journal or whatever, but it was, it was a treasure trove. Um, then this guy Bangs went to Florida to study manatees, and he's in the, this is right after that 1894-95 freeze, the Great Freeze, and it, he was there to study manatees, like I say, but the manatees were all killed, and he says that there was nearly every tree along the whole stretch of the Indian River was killed to the ground by that 1895. Then there's this other one, this Nicholson, you guys have probably heard, you've heard about the seaside sparrow and how it went extinct. So this guy Nicholson was there, 1828, working on the seaside sparrow. And he found them nesting in small mangrove trees on Merritt Island. These were small little mangrove trees right there at Merritt Island by the Kennedy Space Center. And he put this picture in his paper, and this is a black and white picture. And um, that, that stem and old, dead black mangrove tree. So now the little mangroves are coming back, but sometime in the distant past, it could have been that 1835 freeze, there, this had been a big black mangrove forest. So there's come and go. This I put in just for, I hope you appreciate this. <laughs> this is uh, something that, this is uh, the cover page of that book I was telling you about, Charles Vignoles, he did this gorgeous book. And um, he, this is, here, right there. This is Ponce Inlet. And so he's, he's telling us about the Ponce Inlet. He says that uh, mosquito or New Smyrna entrance is narrow, but affords vessels, water for vessels drawing 10 feet. The anchorage is good inside and on the south shore. A vessel may lay alongside and make fast to the mangroves within a mile of the bar. So where he's talking about is where that blue line is. So that's the entrance. So you can come in there with a boat with a 10-foot draft, and you can tie up along mangroves, uh, tie up to mangroves along that blue line there. And it, his boat is has a 10-foot draft. Well, I got myself a book on old ships in 1823. This would have been about a 100 to 150-foot schooner coming in from the ocean. So you can imagine you wouldn't be tying your your schooner up to a little multi-stem Avicennia shrub. It would have to have been a serious big tree, and it was the biggest mangrove tree I had a picture of, so I just stuck it in there. So this is, this is sort of reading between the lines on this historical information. Anyway. So for the, I think we have the his, history between the mangroves and the mangrove, or the, these big killer freezes. I also was trying to figure out how could I link these hurricanes to mangrove expansion. So um, my hypothesis was that mangroves at the range edge are also dispersal limited. They may be freeze limited, but they're still dispersal limited. And hurricanes are a major driver for mangrove expansion by transporting propagules south to north during these storm events. So I had a young guy working for me at the time who's now doing his dissertation at Manchester University. He's a geneticist. You know, you can imagine a geneticist wouldn't want to come. Um, 
But he told me he could measure, if he, with, with genetics tools, he could measure dispersal different distances. I mean, you guys probably say, well, of course, right? That was news to me. So, so I figured then if we had a hurricane and I knew the genetic properties of the source, the source, potential source of these mangroves, and then I could follow that up the coast to these inlets and uh, collect propagules, I could, that would, and I find propagules delivered further north, that would be evidence that the storms were carrying these propagules these long distances. But the first thing I had to do was, um, well, this is the hypothesis. So the mangroves, the mangroves are going to be move, moved north by the storm event. So that, that was. So the first thing we did, we had to, to genotype the, source popu the potential source populations. And to do that, we just went around the coast, found these sites, collected leaves from 30-ish uh, trees, 10 meters apart for each site. And we have uh, something like 41 sites along each, the, both sides of Florida and all the way out to Brownsville. So that was the first step and, you know, hoping no hurricane comes in the meantime. Um, and then we also surveyed the inlets. So it seems like, you know, if, if propagules land on the beach, they're just going to dry up. So if we're meant for the propagules to get established, they've got to land on soft and so wet soil that's going to be that way. So that means they've got to get along that east coast, which is just solid beach. They have to get into an inlet. So I targeted, you know, you can't sample every square inch, so I just targeted inlets. So I went from inlets, from Fort Pierce, all the way to the St. Mary's River. And uh, we collected propagules during years when there was no hurricanes. And uh, then we just waited. So we had, by doing that, we had the, the baseline information that we would need in case there was, when there was, a hurricane. So then we had Hurricane Irma. It was, I mean, you can't wish for a hurricane, right? But if you have a hurricane, it's time to go sample propagules. Um, so we went back out and we resurveyed those beaches to count how many propagules were there and compare that to what it was when there was no storm. We genotyped all those propagules so that we could calculate where they, figure out where they came from. And um, then it was up to John Paul to calculate this dispersal distance. So what we found, you know, this is, these are the inlets and this is uh, just two of the time periods, uh, 2014, October 2014. This was a year, no hurricanes, so the, that's the little green symbol. You can see there was virtually no propagules on the beaches as we did these transects. These are two meter transects walking, series of 100 meter long transects uh, up the beaches on either side of these inlets. Then we went back after, after the hurricane and did the same thing. And so you can see the red dots. And um, uh, it's going from 27.5, that's Fort Pierce, up to um, just over 30.5, that's Fort Clinch there on the St. Mary's River. So we found there no propagules there, no, certainly no mangroves there, it's only salt marsh. Um, going from uh, zero to two meters, two propagules per meter square. That doesn't seem like a lot, except there's gazillion meter squares up there, you know. So this was thousands of propagules being washed up, uh, coming up the coast. So uh, for all of those inlets, um, we, we did our transects, counted to get those. And I collected 100 propagules from each of the site and sent them to John Paul for uh, to do the genetics on it, to compare them. Uh, these, uh, these bars here represent the source populations where we had, this is the potential source of the propagules. And they go from all the way up there. The black bar on the, on the east coast, that is St. Augustine, then Matanzas Inlet, and then going all the way around to, to southwest Florida and um, up to um, around Sarasota and then up Cedar Key. So we, we did the whole coast there. So this was the result of that. And you can see from, um, from St. Augustine north to the St. Mary's River, it's mostly red. And so that means that most of the propagules that got to those beaches came from the Matanzas Inlet 
area. Except if you look at the St. Mary's River, there's that little bit of yellow out at the end. And that came from um, the northern end of the Indian River Lagoon. It's only 1.4%, but 1.4% of a few thousand propagules is still, you know, it's a fairly big number. Then when you get down to Matanzas Inlet, still most of them are coming locally from right there, except you get all these other colors mixed in coming from sites further and further away, including some sites. There were some of the propagules that we found that came from as far away as Cedar Key. That's like 1,200 kilometers. And I've had people, including Tuck Hines, say to me, well, they could have blown across the coast. Well, I think that's, they, I suppose that's possible. But, <laughs> but if you look at the currents, this is the, the current coming out of the Gulf and going through the Straits of Florida and up the coast. Uh, this, this is, uh, Rick Lumpkin sent me this image of uh, that the, uh, the Florida River program put together. And so there's clearly currents that could possibly have carried those propagules around there and up to the East Coast. And, and there's other maps that they have that there's gyres that they're in the, um, the bite, the Florida bite. There's the gyres there. So I think it, it, for me, it says they came by water. I suppose they could have uh, have blown over too. All right, so sort of kind of putting that together, I thought that, you know, <laughs> um, maybe I know enough to guess about the, I know the, uh, I know now and I know the past 70 years. Um, I know that in 1774, in 1788, we know from, from Michaud and Bartram that were mangroves there. So we know that they were there. We know from the historical record that was, there was no freeze events prior to 1835. There was citrus growing to Charleston. If there, if there were mangroves around, there was going to be a lot of them because it had been warm for 100 years. Um, Then there's, this is, this is the segment, uh, this is the piece of time where the Landsat images, the uh, Kavanaugh et al. 2014 paper. This happened, this, this segment is right on the heels of those five freezes that happened in the 80s decade when it was the most severe cold recorded for Florida. There would have, they would have started with zero, right? It would have been a zero beginning and then Going up to 2011, there was this gradual increase. Then the next, this is the Wilford curve, right? Going back to 1942, seeing the increase uh, following the hurricanes and the decreases following the freezes and the increases following the hur hurricanes. But can we go further back? It, because we see this pattern, can I, can I estimate, can I guesstimate what it was in the past? I, I think so, right? This is no modeling involved. I'm sure that if Kyle was doing this, it would be a nice numerical model there, but it, this is just my eyeballing it. So I put a blue asterisk there at the end. I, some of you may know about Bartram reported an 18, or a 17, a 1766 freeze in Jacksonville, but he also reported the temperature. It was minus 3.3 is the coldest that he got, 26 degrees Fahrenheit is what he reported. So that would have been enough to kill a few leaves on a plant, but it wasn't enough. It would not have killed mangroves. So we know that there were, if there were mangroves, it would have been on a lot of them up until that 1835 freeze, and it would have zapped, it would have killed everything. But then after that, we have these hurricanes that would have, you know, mangroves would have accumulated after that, then they would have died again after the freeze and accumulated. So this is my guesstimate of what the past 300 years has been, that it's been one expansion and contraction after another, that, you know, what we're seeing now, we're in an expansion mode. But, you know, what about the future? I can guesstimate about the future. So it, it may just make sense. It gets warmer, there's going to be fewer freeze events, right? So we can just expect mangroves to continue to, to grow and take over. But, and plus there's going to be more hurricanes that's going to carry these propagules further north, right? But what if there's more freeze events? And that seems counterintuitive. If there's more freeze events, then there would be a decrease in mangroves. Well, I ran into, no, 
this past winter has been very enlightening. I've spent so many days trying to understand polar vortex. I can't tell you how many things I've read and just too stupid to understand it. But uh, NASA came out, or yeah, no, NOAA came out with this wonderful graphic. This was in, uh, on their website in January, dissecting a polar vortex. So the winds, you know, these polar vortex are up about five miles above the Arctic, and they're moving in this counterclockwise fashion, and they basically keep old air over the Arctic. But according to, to their analysis is that climate change is going to destabilize, is going to disrupt the polar vortex. And there's two disruptions that they describe. One is can shift, you know, move sideways, but it can also become wobbly. And so you get increased lobes of this cold air escaping from the Arctic. And if that's the case, then that predicts more freeze events, more is push it down into the Okay. So in a, in a sense, you, you know, it, logic says it's going to get warmer, there's going to be more mangrove. But this says, well, maybe not. Anyway. So in conclusion, I think that, um, I, I think the history says that, that um, tells us that both mangroves and salt marshes have dominated the assistance for a very long time. And they, these shifts in dominance is part of what's happened. But we're seeing now with this climate warming, we're seeing this advance. And the question is, is it going to be a continuation of that? That's, that's, that's what people are predicting. Um, I think the historical record has just been spectacularly eye-opening for me. To understand that past has helped me appreciate the present so much more. And I feel better about even thinking about the future because knowing that. Um, and coupling that with what John Paul was able to do with the genetics data that you can actually calculate this, you know, number of fuels northward. And I think, I think the, what I would, if I had, Another lifetime to work, but um, it's your job. <laughs> um, I would I would ask how do how do climate change factors, including all of these things. There's no, you know, climate change is the not the only part of global change that we need to consider. Um, so there's there's the storm. There's there's the um, Precipitation change, you know, increased precipitation is going to wash over this landscape and all this, all these nutrients that have been washing around, growing lots of crops is going to wash into the coastline. So the, the interaction between nutrient enrichment and climate change has got to be seriously considered. I think in some, some systems people are working on that. In mangroves, we have, we're just now getting there, and I think we, we should do more. Because there's, there seems to be an interaction, but also a synergistic effect between um, these, these different components of, of global change. Anyway, that's my story. I have grown thousands of these propagules, and now I have a, I have several sites with them planted out too to see if they will grow. And I'm not telling anybody where they are, but. <laughs> I'd, yeah, yeah. I would have planted more, but I, you know, I had to do it rather surreptitiously, so. <laughs> Well, uh, Randall Hughes and I have, have put, submitted a proposal to try and do just that. So far, you know, we haven't gotten, yeah, yeah, that, yes. And I know that she's following up on it, yeah. Uh, I 
and so the whole idea that, that hurricanes are moving to tropical ground, but um, in, in, in your talk also that it's always moving them from north to south, or I'm sorry, from south to north, because that's the way the hurricanes are moving. But wouldn't it depend on where the mangrove is in the hurricane? Um, for example, with Hurricane Irma, it worked really well for your side because the hurricane was moving up the west coast, mm -hmm. so the winds were moving from the, the south to the north. Whereas if Irma had actually come up off the east coast, right, like Donna, the wind would have been blowing it down. So yeah, equally, has equal potential to blow and go from the north to the south. Well, if it was wind driven, but if it's current, it would the current still would have been coming up the coast, right? No, the, the current would just be following the wind. The current would turn, the around, around, the yeah, would turn around. The Gulf Stream would turn around. Oh. In that case, it could be that all the mangroves on the west coast of, of Florida were actually the probable to be dragged from the north to the south. Yeah. And that could have interesting implications if, if those mangroves at the north have some sort of um, ability to withstand freezes and they're getting pushed to the south, whereas the ones that are from the south are not be able to handle freezes as well and they're getting pushed north. Um, so it's, I'm just and the, the yeah, universe. and there is there are differences, um, um, probably genetic differences between populations and, and freeze tolerance. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, it's you given a hurricane, you take a hurricane. Yeah, you know. <laughs> That's right, looking. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the other things that happened that I didn't tell you about because it's really hard to kind of piece, put into the puzzle, is these propagules that washed up the coast came in with the sargassum. And they were all tangled in the sargassum and they were already growing. I found about a half a dozen that had their first pair of leaves out. They were already sending out lateral roots. So they came ashore, they washed up on the beach and you had to untangle them from, from the sargassum. Um, so I think, I, I, I think that, you know, rafting, rafting and storm events is, might be involved there. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it could just go in direction, just relative to where you are. You know, the literature that you're able to find for that is fascinated by that. Now, you have a species here that you're looking at that by standards, somebody's looking at birds, somebody was looking about a China folk, they see mangroves and they might comment on them. Mm -hmm. We're not, we wouldn't all be so lucky to have something that, that somebody might have observed that way. But if you did. Uh huh. It's so, so difficult. Like yeah. Well, it wasn't not overnight. I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just a Google. God bless Google. You know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 And in, in, on good reads. Yes. And, uh, you know, a lot of things, and Library of Congress. Um, so this isn't just sort of, not randomly, but sort of widely collecting potential bee yeah. journals and things like that. The bee journals, yeah. How I stumbled on the bee journals was there's a, a 1938 paper by Penfound and Hathaways from, it was in uh, Ecological Monographs, and they, it's a, everybody cites his paper. I don't think anybody reads it. <laughs> <laughs> But these guys did a survey of the marshes around New Orleans, and I think it was a, um, I forget, maybe seven mile radius around um, New Orleans. And they described all the different wetland types that they, it must have been more than seven, but they describe these to the south, to the south, down the river of New Orleans, is black mangroves that are 20, they're using feet, 25 feet tall.
And they say in there that, that locals call them honey mangrove. Well, that was, that was like manna from heaven for me because it gave me a search term it never occurred to me to look for. And so I started searching on honey mangrove, which got me to the beekeeper's journal and uh, all kinds of bee literature that you wouldn't, yeah. 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 And you know another another that's right. Uh, yeah. But um, herbarium sheets too, you know. There's great things on those. Yeah. Yeah, well, for our surveys, we certainly did. If it was given to me in the literature, and like Vignoli's, he was one of few who, um, who defined his terms. Um, there was a, a, a zoologist came out of the uh, Museum of American History in the late 1800s, and he he had some. He talked about the yellow mangrove and the. I uh, didn't have any white or reds, but you know, it was like you know. A, I really wonder what he's talking about. But, yeah. Yeah. I want to thank you. I was just talking about two strip clothes and having everything to pull the vortex is the right school and I can all the here. I got a flash of this four vortex. Yay. <laughs> You're going to ask you a question, right? Mm. Ronnie, you're supposed to turn them off. I have to get, I have to. Uh, it's one o'clock. It's almost two. two. Oh. No, it's one o'clock here. It's almost one o'clock. I got it. I'm wrong. Anyway. Yeah, go ahead. I was just wondering uh, what you think about the history of mangroves on the Gulf Coast. Did there used to be mangroves here? In Alabama? Mm. I don't know. Does anybody work that out? I did a I did a little bit of search for the Gulf of Mexico before I came, so I thought, you know, maybe somebody already worked this out. But I I have, a, yeah. Oh, I can do it right here. Oops, it's my acknowledgement slide. Um, this is this is the Gulf of Mexico, right? There's this Penfield and Hathaway's paper I was talking about that uh, where they refer to it as the honey. This is a. Uh, a wonderful paper. It's worth reading instead of just just citing. Um, there's this book, A Concise Natural History of East and West Florida by Bernard Romans. This is a very hard book to read, I must say. It's published in 1776. I bought a hard copy before I realized that I could get a, a PDF of it from, from Google Books. But um, in there, uh, Roman says that were it not for the mangroves, the Chanteleur Islands would have washed away long ago. So, um, you know, that there were mangroves. And then um, um, Andre Michaud and Thomas Nuttall got together and they did this book over here, the North American Silva, eight, published it in eight, 1859. And they say that Abyssinia extends from our part of the continent, from Texas to Florida and New Orleans and near the estuary. Uh, where it's often seen brought in um, oyster and fishing boats and usually called mangal. So that says it's along the whole coast. Um, there is this, this 1812 uh, herbarium sheets in the Philadelphia Academy of Science. This is Avicennia. Av uh, Nuttall described it as a new species, Avicennia americana, but it's Avicennia germanans. This is dated, pencil, 1812. So this is in 1812. We know it was down um, near the end of the delta. Um, this woman, Julia Ellen Rogers, she also published a book in, in describing um, mangroves in 1907 all the way up to Cedar Key. So those are not new, even though they're described as new. Um, this is a strange book up here, The White Scalper. I have no idea. But he, he describes... Um, that the banks of the Rio Trinidad, that's a Trinity River coming into Galveston Bay, uh, is charming, deliciously diversified, bordered by rushes and reeds and covered with mangroves. So there's, that was, 
that was a quick search of what I, you know, just just obscure books. And if you, what I found worked. I don't know. I mean, I, I like it's a strange way to. It's not to go into web of science. That's for sure. Um, but I would pick small segments of time, you know, uh, 1800 to 1810, and a search on a mangrove, honey mangrove, genus names, you name it, kind of just honing in on little bits of time. And, uh, you know, and then you find something. It's a thread that takes you to something else. But it, that helped to narrow down. Anyway. I mean, I guess it's probably, so if you think about the red tides that happened, right? Every so often, like 2015, we had a red tide here that affected from the Florida coast to the Atlantic coast, right? So if you have probables, and that's the seasonal circulation, that yeah. it goes from the fall and it goes from the east to the west. So if your probables are from Florida, like the red tide is, you can get here in certain years. So whether or not it gets up into a place where it's yeah. warm, lots of polish events. Yeah. One of the things I've found too is in part of my sampling on these plants along these in the ecotone is they I should have put these data up there but they are they become super reproductive trees that are just weighted down with propagules um, so it's it, I've done the latitudinal gradient sampling from from way down in the Keys all the way up to St Augustine and counting flowers and then going back and counting and measuring propagule size and the, the trees up by St. Augustine are just uh, so much more. I mean, it's just that I got an R square of like 0.8 or something in, in, in size going up the coast. Um, also, the plants at near the top end of the range become reproductive as babies. You know, you get this precocious reproduction happening at these, yeah. And it's also about artifacts, right? There's this classic turkey that sort of takes Yeah. Well, I think the next 30 years will be way cool to figure out what's going to happen. All right. Well, thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> meeting a few years